Well, I definitely have to thank our worship team for stepping up today. And uh, didn't they do a great job today? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's like coming into the Super Bowl and saying, well, you're starting quarterback and your best right receiver's out with the flu. Uh, but they did a great job. Great job. Well, this morning, if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to Matthew chapter 11. Once again, back to the book of Matthew. Last week, we were in chapter 9. This week, we're going to be in chapter 11. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 6 of Matthew chapter 11 today. Um, as Mike said, uh, Lisa has been out since Tuesday with the flu. And I know it's going around. We still have people out of church with that. And so I just got to tell you, she, uh, I've taken very good care of her, I promise. But I had two industrial sized bottles of Lysol spray, one in each hand. And anywhere she went, anything she touched, I was like this everywhere. And so far, thank you, Jesus, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying. Uh, she is sick and tired of smelling Lysol, I can tell you that. Well, anyway, uh, we're going to get back into our series today entitled Gut Check. And so I was thinking about what the Lord would have me to say to you today. Uh, something popped into my mind, and it's something that we all deal with. In fact, if you were honest in your life, you have dealt with this in some way, shape, fashion, or form. I was thinking about doubts. About every, Everybody deals with doubts in their life. Does anybody ever deal with any doubt in your life? Okay. Now, now, there's a lot of things that we sometimes doubt when it comes to our life. I was thinking about the fact that some of us doubt that we will ever win an argument with a certain person, right? I would think that there's times that we think that, they, that we doubt. How, how many of you ever doubt that you're ever going to get ahead? Anybody? Okay. It just seems like no matter how hard you try, you can't get ahead. You just doubt that you're ever going to get ahead. I was thinking about that. What about this? Right now, somebody, and it may be you, is going through something, or you know somebody going through something, and you doubt that you're going to get through this. And now I'm starting to hit home, aren't I? And then there's doubts that we have in our life. That you, Have you ever said, I, I doubt that I'm ever going to see this happen? Have you ever been there? Now, I've got one like that, and it happened last Sunday uh, when I was watching my Vikings play the Eagles on TV. Two weeks ago, I guess. Two Sundays ago. You know, I've been a Minnesota Vikings fan since I was in fifth grade. Everybody knows that who knows me. And finally, my team is set up to where it was just, it was destiny bound to happen. The Super Bowl is going to be in Minnesota. Now, I know there's controversy around the NFL and all that, and I'm not getting into that. I'm just saying if you've been a Vikings fan since the fifth grade, you begin to doubt that they're ever going to win a Super Bowl. I figured I'd hear a few amens to that. <laughs> Come on, guys, lighten up. Okay, we're in church. You know, we're not, we're not in prison. We're in church, okay? We can be happy. We're showing you grace. You're showing me grace. Yeah, okay. I appreciate that, brother. So, so now I doubt again if they're ever going to make it to the Super Bowl and win. We have those doubts. But one thing about the football season is the fact that no matter who, who ends up in the Super Bowl, in two weeks, we get to have the Dave Tone of 500. Amen. All right, I hit some fans there. Yes, yes. We may have to give up. You know, the NFL, I, and I'm not getting political here, but I'm tired of the way they're treating some of the things in this country. But if you're a NASCAR fan, you are a redneck, and you love the Lord, and you love NASCAR, and you love your country. Amen. Amen. Uh, you will never find anybody on a knee at a NASCAR race, I can tell you that. Only if they're praying. That's right. Good one. That's right. Yeah, they're going to be praying to Jesus. All right. So, so we have a lot of doubts in our life. I'm sure there's things right now that when I said those things, it triggered things in your mind where you, you doubt some things. You have in the past. You are right now. You probably will in the future. But what about when it comes to our faith? You know, I think a lot of times as believers, we we, we got to put this front up and, and we got to pretend that, you know, I'm this super Christian. Anybody here a super Christian? We may think we are. We may try to act like we are. I'll bet you today you put on your best and you come in with a smile on and you're acting like everything's peachy king and it's not. See, in reality, 
We're taught as believers that you, you, you just you don't doubt those things. Uh, but somewhere inside, there's something that just makes us sometimes just have some kind of a doubt and, and we don't want to deal with it because we're not supposed to feel that way. You know, I think that uh, probably, if I was going to be honest with you as a preacher even, your pastor, there's times that I have doubts in, some, some, in my faith. And I'm not talking about necessarily doubting my salvation, though even as... Now, now I want to tell you this because we've got some new believers in here. And, and just because you've struggled after you give your life to the Lord, and just because sometimes you doubt, well, did I really give my life to the Lord? Just because you doubt your salvation doesn't mean you're lost. You see, sometimes I think God lets us doubt to a point so that we can solidify our lives to the point that we can get even stronger and do more for Him. You hear what I'm saying? And so, uh, one guy heard what I said. And so, our doubts, you know, this can be audience participation. If you want to say, Amen, I agree, praise God, whatever you want to do, you go ahead and do that. But there are times in my faith, even though I don't doubt my salvation anymore, you know why I don't doubt my salvation? Because, because Jesus said, if I'm in His hands, nothing can ever take that away. So I believe that if I didn't do anything to save myself, I just gave my life to Jesus, and He came in and saved me from my sin, my sinful self, and I placed my life in His hands, that I can't take that away, and no one can, even the devil. So I don't have to doubt my salvation. But there's times in my life when I doubt some things as my Christian walk, and I have to ask myself, why do I doubt that? You know, sometimes our faith is tried and tested like never before. You want to find out how to try and test your faith? You start trying to live for Jesus the way Jesus has called you to live for Him, and you will face trials and temptations. You see, sometimes in our faith, we get to the point that we just, there's some kind of a doubt that tries to creep in. And that's when we turn and do that gut check. And we go back to the heart of what Christianity is all about. We go back to the central centrality of the Bible that talks about Jesus and God's plan of salvation. And we have to look within ourselves and say, I've got to do something with this. You know, our scripture text for today... It's about a man named John the Baptist. He had to be a good man because he was a Baptist, right? Amen. He was John the Baptist. He was a wild man. Did you know that? John the Baptist was out in the wilderness. He was raised up. You know, you could just see him being raised by a pack of wolves, you know. And he was raised up out there and he was eating locusts and wild honey and, and all this. Wore a coat of, 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 of camel's hair. Had a leather belt tied around his waist. He was a man's man. He was a mountain man. Well, he was an outdoors man. Maybe not a mountain man, but an outdoors man. He was a warrior. He came on the scene and he was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. The one that the Old Testament talked about, that he was going to prepare the way for the Lord to come. He was sold out for Jesus. But in this passage... In Scripture. In this passage today, we're going to see that same man, John the Baptist, the wild man, the warrior, the forerunner of Jesus, the one who was sold out for Christ. He was struggling. He was searching. Why? Well, how could a guy like that have any kind of a doubt in his life? We're going to look at this passage together. We're going to see John the Baptist, the, the warrior for Jesus, with something there that just seemed like he had a doubt for at least a moment in his life. Let's stand. We're going to read this together in John, cha or excuse me, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding His twelve disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. And he said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. 
The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you, God, for this day. I thank you for your word. We stand upon your word today, Lord. Lord, your word never comes back void. I pray that you would touch hearts and minds today with your Holy Spirit speaking to us, Lord. Lord, I pray if there's someone here today that doesn't know Christ as Savior, that they would open up their hearts and get rid of all doubt, and they would nail it down today that Jesus would be Lord of their life. Lord, for us as believers, help us, Lord, to deal with anything here, God, that you speak to us, God. I don't know what you're going to share with these people because I'm just going to open my mouth and I pray you would share your word. God, we love you. We praise you. Our thoughts, our focus, our hearts and minds are tuned into you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. So as the passage that I've read to you today talks about Jesus being here on this earth. Jesus walking, Jesus talking, Jesus teaching, Jesus leading. In verse 2, it comes to the point when it talks about John the Baptist. In verse 2, it says, And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. We see John in prison. You know, sometimes I think when we talk about prison, we don't get a picture of where John really was in his life. John the Baptist was not only in prison, he was in a dungeon. And not only in a dungeon, he was in a dungeon of all dungeons. It was King Herod who had a dungeon that was built for once he wanted to get rid of and not have to deal with anymore. Why did King Herod not want to deal with John the Baptist? Well, John the Baptist was the only one who was brave enough to stand up to him and to declare, you are committing adultery with your sister-in-law. You see, Herodias was his sister-in-law, and he began to commit adultery with her, and they were together, and John the Baptist told them that you were doing wrong. Sometimes, and this is a side note, sometimes when you stand up for the truth and tell the truth like it is, and you say when something's wrong, call it the way it is, sometimes you'll pay a price for that. King Herod decided that he did not want anything to do with John. So he took John and he put him in a dungeon. And John, at this point in time, when you study into the text, John had been in prison for about a year in a dungeon. Now you think about John the Baptist and you think of his life. He was a wild man, remember? He was out in the desert. He was doing his own thing. He was free. He was eating locusts and wild honey, running with the animals. He was doing his thing. He came on the scene, preached that Jesus, to prepare the way that the Messiah was coming, John the Baptist was a free man. And once he stood up to the king, John the Baptist became imprisoned by the king. You know, I think that sometimes we forget, as I just stated... When we live for the Lord, we're going to face persecution. When you stand up for Jesus, you are going to have people that are going to do things to you, want to do things to you, say things about you, and try to harm you. You see, I believe that the truth that I see in this Scripture, number one, is this. When life gets hard, doubts can creep in. The harder life gets the more you begin to doubt. In fact, John himself, and I believe this, everyone has the possibility for doubts to creep into their life. Even as believers, you may be the strongest believer that you know of to date that is walking the face of this earth, but you still have possibility for doubt to creep in. I believe that everybody has a breaking point. I believe that everybody has a point when doubts try to creep in. You think about the Old Testament. We talk about Moses. Moses was a man of God. Moses was a strong warrior for God. Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses Moses had his moments of doubt. God, God, you you, you want me to to, to go to to, to the king, to the the Pharaoh? I, I can't even talk. 
Abraham, God's chosen man to become the father of all nations, said, Lord, you're, you're going to make me the father of all nations? I don't even have a child. Gideon, God called Gideon to step up and go out and to lead the armies. And Gideon says, but God, you've got to prove it to me here. I, I, I just don't know. God, you've got to prove it to me here. How many of us say that? God, if you want me to do this, you're going to have to show me here, 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 and here. And we lay out what we want. And in truth, we're just doubting God and we're asking God to do something. You've got to be careful about that. The 12 disciples... The 12 disciples themselves doubted many times. They walked with Jesus. They talked with Jesus. They were taught by Jesus, but they still had doubt. And even John. You know, in chapter 11, over in verse 11, look what Jesus says about John. You think you're some kind of a Christian? Look at this. In chapter 11, verse 11, Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. How would you like for Jesus to say that about you? There is no one ever who has walked the face of this earth that is a better believer, a stronger follower, better at leading others than you. But yet John the Baptist had some kind of a doubt. You see, I believe that everybody has a point that doubt can creep in. Sometimes, now listen to me folks, I'm talking about you and me. Sometimes circumstances can get you down. Sometimes you can say, okay, I can handle this, I can handle this, I can handle this, and then finally something else happens, and you're like, I just can't handle anymore. Anybody ever been there? I just don't know that I can take anymore. It's an accumulation of circumstances and conditions that get you to the point where there's this, there's this doubt that comes in. Maybe it's something that's undeserved. God, do I really deserve this? I'm trying to live for you. I'm trying to follow you. I'm teaching a Sunday school class. I'm in church every Sunday. And then all of a sudden doubt creeps in. Sometimes it can be an unmet expectation. Let me ask you this question. How many of you can look back on your life? Let's go way back for some of you, not so much for some of us. Go back to your teenage years. It hadn't been that far back for me. Um... How many of you, when you were in high school, can you think back that far? Some of you are there right now. Some of you haven't even got there yet. But how many of you in high school would say, when I was in high school, up till today, this is exactly where I thought I would be in my life? Now, yeah, you're laughing, right? I had no idea. How many of you really thought that you'd be right here, right now, in your life, not sitting in church, but in your life, In this point in your life, this is exactly where I thought I would be. My plans worked out perfectly. Here I am. Probably nobody. If you would have told me in high school that I was going to be standing up here preaching, I would have laughed at you. I would have said, you're crazy. I was the one that didn't want to walk down the aisle to take up the offering because I didn't want to be in front of people. My son's the same way, but... God brought me out of my shell, and I know he's bringing him out of his shell. If if you would have told me my son when he was in high school, he'd be up here playing drums, I'd have said, you're crazy. He would never do that. I didn't convince him of that. I think God did. You see, sometimes when we expect things in our life, and we have plans and dreams. How many of you have plans and dreams? Anybody? Yeah, we do. We've got those. And that's okay. But sometimes our plans and dreams don't work out the way we thought. Sometimes we get to a point in our life and we say, what in the world is going on? I And a broken dream or an unmet expectation. Do you think John had that in his life? Think about John. Think about John the Baptist. John the Baptist had everything going for him. He was a warrior for Jesus. He was saying, prepare the way. In John chapter 1, if you just saw it, you'd have thought, man, this guy is on fire for Jesus. Nothing's ever going to get him down. And John the Baptist is probably sitting in prison with nothing but time on his hands. And he's thinking, I I went from that to this? What happened? Me and Jesus, we were going to do a lot of things together. We were going to change the world together. And now I'm in in a dungeon? 
You know, sometimes when life gets hard, doubts creep in. I want you to hear this today because some of you probably deal with things like this right now. You know, as believers, God has not called us to a walk in the park. He's called us to a war zone. In Ephesians chapter 6, if you're taking notes, we're not going to go there. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, it talks about the full armor of God. You know what it's talking about? It says that we don't wrestle against things in this world. We're wrestling against much, a much bigger picture than we see. God doesn't call us to, to a, a trip to an amusement park. He calls us to a battlefield. When you sign up on the dotted line that I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, I will give you my life. He calls you to the front lines, not to the back row. God has not called us to an easy life. God has called us, listen, God's called us to eternal life. And if you think about that for a moment, folks, you may have the roughest life on this earth, but someday, someday, someday as a believer in Christ, someday you will be in heaven in all glory and everything will fade away. Isn't that a nice thought? How, how many of you ever prayed this prayer? Lord, I can't take anymore. Jesus, just come back right now. Just come on back. I'm tired of it. Just come on back. I prayed that prayer more than once. See, when life gets hard, doubts can creep in, even to the strongest believers, even John the Baptist. Next thing, sometimes we need just a little reassurance. Sometimes each of us just need that little bit of extra reassurance in our life. Isn't it nice when somebody reassures you of something in life? You know, it's just like this morning. All of a sudden we throw a different group uh, uh, happen to lead this morning on our worship team. And I come in trying to reassure you, you guys can do this. And I, I, I knew you could. And I didn't call Diane and tell her before she got here because I was afraid she wouldn't come if I told her she was going to lead the piano today. And she walked in this sanctuary and I go, Diane, or I was out in the hallway. I said, Diane, I got something to tell you. She goes, I know, I already heard in the, hall, in the kitchen. But she stepped up and did it. And the others did too. And, and so, so, Gary, Cody, better watch out. Yeah. But sometimes we need a little reassurance, don't we? How about this? This is, this is something I would, uh, just come to my mind. I'll guarantee you there's somebody here today, everybody here today, we come together to edify this body. You know what edify means? To build each other up. If we're not building each other up, then we're not reassuring and giving each other the courage to go out and live our lives for Christ. Have you encouraged anybody today? You may say, I need some encouragement. Well, guess what? The person sitting beside you does too. You encourage them and they encourage you and we go out and we fight the battle together. John the Baptist needed some reassurance. It brought him to the question in verse 3. John sent two of his disciples out and in verse 3, and here's what they asked Jesus. He said, go ask Jesus this question. Are, are you the coming one, which would mean Messiah? Are you the Messiah? You see, they were waiting for the Messiah for hundreds of years. Since the Old Testament, they were waiting for the Messiah, the promised one that was prophesied in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. They were prophesying about that. And all of a sudden, Jesus is on the scene. John the Baptist says, prepare the way. He has come. The Messiah has come. I am not worthy to untie his sandals. I'm not worthy to baptize you, Jesus. And now he's asking this question. Are you, are you really the one? Are you the coming one? Or, that's the other side of the coin, or do we look for another? How could John the Baptist say that? You know what that does? That gives me hope. If John the Baptist could, could question and have a little bit of doubt and need that kind of reassurance, then it's okay because when somebody tells me, good job, preacher, you preached a, a good message today, that helps me. But John the Baptist was doubting even if Jesus was truly... Now, I, now there's a lot of interpretations here, so I don't want to hit this too negatively. Just because John the Baptist, and this will go for you too, just because John the Baptist needed this question answered doesn't mean that he didn't believe in Jesus. Okay? So I'm glad I said that because that's not what I meant. 
you know, that he didn't believe in Jesus, but he just needed to say, okay, I, I, I just need to be reassured. You go to him and you make sure, because guess what? He was in a dungeon in prison about to die for his faith. Do you know what happened to John the Baptist a short time after this that we find later on the passage? John the Baptist, he lost his head. Herodias' daughter danced for King Herod. And King Herod said, you know, I'll give you anything up to half the kingdom. And, and she said her mother wanted this. And she said, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And that is so gross sounding, isn't it? But that's exactly what happened. John the Baptist's head was cut off, put on a platter, and she presented it to her mother. You think you're having a bad day? You think your circumstances are bad? I'm not trying to play that down. I'm saying John the Baptist, his head was on the line. Sometimes we need a little reassurance. Here's what we're really saying. Now you think about your faith. You know what John the Baptist was really saying when he asked that question? He was saying this. He was saying, I, I, I can just see it in him. I, I know my faith is strong. I know this, but this is not what I thought. Jesus, I thought we was going to be marching into Jerusalem together. I thought we was going to take over the world together because they thought the world was going to be taken over at that time by the Messiah, not down the road when he came back in all of his glory. So his expectations were still that, that Jesus was going to free everyone, and here he is in prison. You know what John the Baptist was saying? Here's what he was saying. It's the same thing that you ask so many times in your faith, in your walk, as you serve the Lord. Is it worth it? Jesus, is this really worth what I'm doing? God, do you really know what you're doing? Father, do you really understand what I'm going through? God, do you see that I'm, I'm bound here? God, do you see that, 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 that this is not what I planned? God, do you see that uh, I wanted to do all these great things for you, and now I can't do anything? God, don't you know that I lived out in the wilderness, and now I've got, I'm in jail, in prison, in a dungeon? God, is it worth it? And I believe sometimes we have to answer that question ourselves. You see, in reality, Jesus tells us before you sign on the dotted line, here's what Jesus says. You count the cost. You make sure that you're willing to do what it takes to do to follow me. You know what we do with Christianity? We make it so watered down. We make it so weak. We say, come to Jesus. Be forgiven of your sins. Go to heaven. Yeah, that's great. But what about the following? We can't even get people to show up for church, let alone to go out and be warriors for Jesus. Lord, is it worth it? You know, I think that if you ever ask that question in your life, God, is it really worth it? The one thing that takes everything off the table is this. When Jesus was walking to the cross, when Jesus was carrying his own cross, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, when he was bleeding for you, dying for you, stood in your place, went to, to, the, to the grave for you, Jesus said, you're worth it. Is there anything God could ever ask you to do that He hasn't done a thousandfold more for you? You see, sometimes we just have to be sure and we need to be reassured that whatever you're going through right now, whatever you're dealing with, even if you have doubts in your life, it is worth it, folks. Let me tell you today, I want to encourage you one by one by one, whatever it is, if you're living for Jesus, it is worth it. Next thing. And this just came to me as I was reading this. And it's like, wow, this is just pretty cool. And you, you, may, you guys may not think this is cool, but I, when, have you ever had God give you a little nugget and you're like, yeah, I, I, I get it. Now listen to this. Are you listening? Let me make sure you're still awake here, guys. Are you listening? Okay. You're just so intense, you just can't even take your focus off it, right? Okay. I just make sure it didn't have lost you like you're in left field right now. Here's what God gave me. If you can't see Jesus, you find someone else who can. If you can't see Jesus, you find someone else who can. 
Have you ever been at a point in your life when you just couldn't hear from God, you couldn't just see God, you couldn't get the right picture? Anybody, anybody there? Raise your hands if you've ever been there. I've had times in my life when I just could not quite see, Jesus, where are you? God, I can't hear you. Lord, I'm out here. Father, I, I, I can't see. I, I can't hear. And, and that's exactly where John was. You know what John did? He did the only thing he could do. Now, he did this in the physical sense, but so many times it's in the spiritual sense. If you're struggling with something and you're having any kind of doubts and you don't know what to do and you can't hear from God, you find somebody who can. There's been times in my life when I've had to ask somebody, just like John the Baptist, he asked these two disciples, two followers, to go and to get a word from God. You know, I think what John was saying, and it's so many times what you need to say in your life, John was saying, help me. I've fallen and I can't get up. I can't see you, God. I can't hear you, God. I need you, God. And that's when we turn to other brothers and sisters in Christ. How many of you have somebody in your life that you are close enough to in your Christian walk when you need something, when you have to hear from God, you need to hear from God, you can turn to them and they can help you? Anybody? I hope you do. If you don't, you need somebody like that. That's why we do Sunday school. That's why we do journey groups. That's why we try to connect together. Because you're not going to raise your hand right now and say, Preacher, I need help. I mean, if you did, that's great. We'll, we'll stop and pray right now. But you're probably not going to do that in a setting like this. But when you're around a table or around a circle with four, five, six, eight, ten, twelve people around it, sometimes you will finally say, I know these people, I'm comfortable with these people, and I need help. And that may be you today. So the message is clear on this point. If you're here today and you can't hear from God and you need God and you want an answer and, and you're looking and, and you're trying to do it by yourself, the worst thing you can do is be isolated and alone and hold it all in. The best thing you can do is let somebody help you. The last thing I want you to hear today. Never let your understanding of Jesus cause you to stumble over Jesus. Never let your, your personal understanding of Jesus let you stumble over Jesus. Now, what do I mean by that? We'll, we'll look at verse 6. Now, Jesus had just told the two disciples that came to him in verse 4 and 5, go and tell John what you see, what you hear, the, the blind see and the lame walk and all these things. And, and so John can't see that and hear that, but all of a sudden he gets a fresh reassurance from God. Yes, this is Jesus, the Messiah. But in verse 6, Jesus tags this on, and it's not just an extra hashtag. It's not like an extra piece. This is so important to this passage. Look at verse 6. He says, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Now, when you look at that at face value, you think, what was Jesus trying to say? Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Well, let's hit this first, the word offended. Now, we're going to find out what that true word means here in a moment. But how many of you, folks, listen, how many of you are sick and tired of people being offended about everything? Amen. You can't sneeze. You can't walk down the hallway. In a, you can't go to a grocery store. You can't get out in public without somebody being offended. You can't say a word. You can't think anything. You can't write anything. Everybody's offended. We live in a world that wants to be offended by everything. Amen? Everything. I'm offended by that. You know what? Here's my motto. I'm offended because people get offended so easy. So just quit being offended because that offends me and you can't offend me. So just quit being offended. Okay? You think that'll work? That probably just offended them, right? It sounds like a vicious circle to me. Now, I got to thinking about that. That word offended, if you look at it in the, in the Greek, actually means stumble. So some of you probably have a Bible that's not a King James or New King James that says stumble instead of offended. That's okay, because actually that translation means stumbled. Offended can still fit that very easily, but listen to it this way. And blessed is he who does not stumble because of me. 
That word stumble, actually, if the, the hearers of that day would have heard that word stumble, this, this Greek word, they would have thought of something in the Old Testament that meant to trap or snare an animal. To cause an animal to stumble, to trap or snare an animal to where they were trapped. And that's what happens when we become offended or stumble in our lives is we become trapped by that. A stumbling block. You know what? I, I was thinking about this and, and I was thinking about being offended. Stumbling. What causes somebody to be offended? What causes someone to be offended? There you go. It does not go along with what they believe. It does not go along with their point of view. It does not fit the context of the way they think. Because I can call y'all a bunch of rednecks and it doesn't offend you. But if I called some high society person a redneck, it would offend them, right? Because I'm not a redneck. I am. I, I fit that description. You see, it depends on the way we look at things, the point of view. Why are some people offended about this and offended by this and offended by this and other people aren't and other people aren't and other people aren't? It depends on how they look at things. Very simple. Their point of view. So I want you to hear this. Now, I'm getting to a point here. Don't, don't, don't lose me here. When Jesus said, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Blessed is he who is, does not stumble because of me. Here's what I believe he was saying. Now, I could be wrong, but I, 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 this is my opinion, and, and I value my opinion very highly. <laughs> now, listen. If, if we rely on our point of view to define who Jesus is, you will become offended. How many of you just got what I said? If we rely on our point of view of what we think Jesus should be, can be, will be, what He will do, what He will say, how He will react, what He will do in our lives, if we rely on our point of view, we are going to stumble over Jesus. We will trip and fall. How many of you have ever said, God, I don't understand what's going on in my life? Anybody? <laughs> I don't understand why. I don't understand how. I don't understand what. God, I don't know. And then sometimes a little bit of doubt tries to creep in. And if you don't do that, it festers. And then you don't know what you believe anymore. And it's because I'm trying to fit my narrative of how life should be, how this world should be, how my life should be, what God should give me by my point of view. When in reality, sometimes our point of view is not where God's point of view is. How many of you are a strong enough Christian that you can see everything from God's point of view? Anybody? If you raise your hand, I'm going to get up here and let you preach instead of me because I don't understand God's point of view. I don't understand why this happens. I don't understand why you have to go through this. I don't understand why God doesn't just wipe out cancer. I don't understand why God doesn't free everybody who's been un unjustly uh, thrown in jail. I don't understand why God doesn't just help people who are hungry and, and feed everybody in the world. I don't understand that. And I don't understand why God doesn't do some things in my life the way I expect to. Do you think John is, was there? John was exactly there. God, this is not what I planned. This is not what I expected. God, I didn't understand it to be this way. Jesus, I thought we, I was going to be sitting at your right hand and we was going to take over King Herod's throne and we was going to rule the world together. When in reality, I can tell you this, you will never understand all there is about God. You can look at that Bible, you can read that Bible, you can go to, to seminary and, and study that Bible, you can know Greek and Hebrew forward and backwards, but you will not understand all there is to know about God. Why? Because we have a limited ability to understand the God who created us, the God of the universe, the God who can do all things, the God who has put this world into motion, the God who is going to send us some Jesus back someday, and we will never understand all there is to know about God. But I do know this. Most of you guys probably know this. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. 
We trust in the Lord with all our hearts. We lean not on our own understanding. In all our ways we acknowledge Him and He will direct our path. You know what? The proverb, the, the, the writer of Proverbs, uh, uh, Solomon was saying there, he was saying, I don't even, Solomon was the wisest man to ever live and he still didn't understand all there was of God. He just said, I got to trust you. You know why we call it walking by faith? It's because sometimes we have to walk by faith and not understand what God is doing. Here's what I do understand. Now listen to me, guys. We're about done. I understand this. God is faithful. Amen. God is faithful even when I am not. You can say, I will always be faithful to God, but you will be lying because there will be points in your life when you will not be faithful to God. I will guarantee you that I do the same thing. God is faithful. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will always hold to His promises. If it says He will do it, He will do it. If He says it's going to be this way, it will be this way. God will always, always be faithful. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You, you know what that means in your life? If you read it in God's Word and you apply the text properly, it doesn't matter if the Bible is 300, 300 million years old, it's still going to be, it's still going to mean something. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and even tomorrow. How about this? God loves you. How many believe God loves you? God's love for you is not conditional, not circumstantial. If you doubt God, if you get mad at God, if you curse at God, if you try to walk away from God, if you're a follower of God, God still loves you. If you're lost and you hate God and you try to run from God and you don't accept God, God still loves you. If you've done the worst thing you can ever think of or the best thing you can ever think of, God still loves you the same. I can guarantee you that. There is nothing that you have done in your life that God cannot forgive you if you will turn to Him and confess it through Jesus Christ. Isn't that nice to know? And some things I get tripped up on, even in my walk with the Lord, because I try to put my understanding on God, and it causes me to stumble. I want to ask Diane, is she still here today? Okay, you moved on me. I thought I'd lost you. Yeah, I thought she ran on me. I'm going to ask Diane to come up and just play me something here. And I want you to think about what we just talked about. When life gets hard, doubts can creep in. Sometimes you need a little reassurance. If you can't see Jesus right now, you need to find somebody who can. And never let your understanding of what you think you think things should be of Jesus to cause you to stumble. Maybe you're here today and you're struggling right now. I don't know who you are, I don't know what your circumstance is, but God does. And you're thinking, man, God, you just hit me so hard today. It wasn't me. It was God. And you're just crying out, I, I need reassurance. God, maybe God, I can't see you. God, I don't want to doubt, but these circumstances and these conditions have gotten so, so something chronic in my life that I just, I, God, I need you, Lord. Here in a moment, we're going to pray and I'm going to ask that you just come and you cry out to God today. You come, let me pray for you. I'm going to ask that you go to someone you know that you can listen to. And maybe you're someone, you know somebody else who's struggling, that maybe there's some doubt there and, 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 and you just want to reassure them and help them in their faith and you want to be a blessing to them. And, and at invitation, you just need to go and say, come on, let's go to the altar and pray about this. Maybe you're here today and, and you're doubting whether you're really saved or not. I don't want to go past that because you can know for sure. Some people say, I just want to be good enough. I'm trying to do the right thing. I, I'm coming to church. That's not good enough for God. We all have sinned. We all need forgiveness. We all need Jesus. And today you just need to nail it down and say, Jesus, I give it all to you. Jesus, I want to accept you as my Savior. And you need to be sure. Take your doubts away. 
Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this time. Lord, as we respond to this invitation, some will respond in their seats. Some will respond and turn away. Some will come to this altar, God. Whatever you call today, it's your altar, your time. You are in control, God. Help us to give it to you all today. In Jesus' name, amen.